Well, welcome to the Temporary Stand in my edition number 40, and we've got a special guest on with us tonight. Um, we've got Jerry Goff, more commonly known on the, the Celtic interweb world as Bilboa Boy. And uh, how are you doing, Jerry? Not too bad, not too bad, Scott. Um, right, so the reason we've got Jerry on tonight is that, uh, as well as being a massive Celtic man, Jerry's also a keen interest in Cliftonville. And and it's it's through that we thought that we'd tap into your knowledge, Jerry, um, mm-hmm. since we know absolutely nothing about them and Marty hates them. So yeah. um, <laughs> it, it falls down it falls down to you to kind of hopefully help us out. No so but, but before we we go into the whole Cliftonville stuff, tell us your Celtic story. Where are you from? How how are you a Tim and how long you're a Tim and whatever. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm from Ayrshire. Um I was born in Irvine, but I'm. Caroline Stevenson. Uh, I'm a, a Tim pretty much because of my dad. Um, he took us to, to games as earlier than I can remember, to be honest. That's, that's, it's that bad, I don't even remember when my first Celtic game was. Um, my first memory of Celtic Park, I think, was kind of running about as a three year old or something like that, putting the seats up and down. So uh, he's, he's took me ever since. And, you know, it's been, I think I've been a season ticket older since about 1988. So, um, hi. Still going, still going strong. Season ticket holder at 1988, were you in the stand, in the main stand? Well, we used to, um, he used to take us in there and then we kind of progressed to the jungle. Mm-hmm. And I think because of the double season, you know, we thought we were going to go into a, <laughs> a rich and glorious history. <laughs> Which, uh, unfortunately, didn't happen. It was kind of miserable for years, but... Uh, Aye, so we stuck out, and eventually, you know, the good well out. Aye, well, it's basically about you sat in the main stand looking at all the empty terracing. Out <laughs> <laughs> of that empty terracing for a while. No, I know, I know, mate. Okay. Aye, that's excellent. Right, okay, so good sailor, man. So you're a big Tim. So let's start off. How did you end up supporting Clifton Phil just so much? Well, can I talk about that terrace? And I, I can you know, you remember all the kind of old fanzines that were getting popped about, and obviously like. Not the view was one of the oldest, but there was one as well that was done by Celtic and Cliftonville fans called From the Cage to the Jungle. Okay. So I've kind of got vague recollections of that, but that wasn't really the real reason I support stuff, you know, supporting them and going over and stuff. I'd finished university and I was staying in Dublin for a wee bit, and like everybody, I found Dublin, you know, ridiculously expensive. So I thought, you know, um, why not go up to Belfast, stay with mates up there and uh, get your dough? So that's, that's what I did. And the guy was showing my flat with Paddy. Him and his brother are big Cliftonville fans. And they took us one day to a game against uh, Glen Torren, which they lost, so it wasn't a good start. But um, there was a guy that used to play um, for Cliftonville when they won the league in 98 called Tim McCann. And he basically joined Glen Torren, kind of sold out sort of thing. And he was getting dogs abuse in the stands. And... Uh, I just remember him actually pointing up at some of the fans. He must have knew them because he was from North Belfast and, you know, threatening them by doing that night and stuff. So <laughs> it was actually, it was that it kind of brought me in. It was the kind of closeness between the fans and the players and just the kind of banter. It was really, it was good fun. So I just kind of, I started falling about since, you know. Nice one, I. So what year would that have been about, Jerry? That would have been about 2003, I think, because I did, I went back over, they played in the League Cup final against, uh, Lan, which is one of the dullest games of football I've ever seen in my life, but they won in penalties, um, so I was with McGoran that night, so uh, it was quite a quite a raucous night, but um, I was about 2003-2004, I started kind of kicking on, but they weren't actually very good by then, they were, they were flipping with relegation and stuff, you know. And so so give us a wee indication, eh, because out my own interest, so 2000, so we've been in Celtic Park, I've been back in Celtic Park five years, things are going relatively well under Martin O'Neill. See Cliftonville then, what, what was the stadium like then? Are you, are you basically going, you're kind of going back to terracing and stuff like that? Yeah, well, the, the, the waterworks end, which is the end that's kind of across for the main stand, there wasn't really any, there wasn't really anything there. Um, Behind the goal was the kind of famous cage end, which has all been kind of done up. It's got a new stand. And then behind the other goal, I don't know if that new stand had been built by then. They kind of built that for away fans. It was kind of like a necessity. The main stand was a bit rickety. But you know yourself, like, if, if the folk are, um, if the folk make it a good experience, you don't kind of pay attention to any of that stuff, really. No, but I think a lot of the fans were kind of disappointed that the old kind of cage stand had went, you know, the mm-hmm. terrace behind the goal. 
That was kind of the jungle, obviously. Yeah, the, re- the reason I'm asking because um, for for people who go to the the GAA and it, it's kind of like getting back to the the early eighties, mid eighties, night early uh, late eighties, where we, it's tennis and stuff, and there's that, that much more better atmosphere. And I just wondered, is, you've already said that the atmosphere is, is what caught you because because we know as much as we love Celtic Park, it can be stale. Yeah. So if you're kind of going back to that kind of madness, then I, I can I could I could see the attraction. Yeah, I think it was because as well, you know, it was like an old Celtic Park where you could kind of stand with your mates, sort of thing, yeah. um, in any section, and that was kind of the case. Um, just well, right up until before this game, you could do that. But um, there's a few guys actually used to stand just kind of under the main stand, and they've had the they've had their section taken away because their seats been put in. So I think they were a bit a bit grumpy and cut off about that. <laughs> um, but I know that's that's party and the people as well. It's there's, there's there's a kinship between you know Irish and Scottish people anyway in terms of uh, just the way they celebrate things and stuff like that. And they just said they kind of they just came for the kind of same kind of background as yourself, and they just enjoyed the football as much yourself and having a drink and stuff like that. And you know it was it was pretty much going from a home to home. There wasn't really much difference. That's what I've always liked about Belfast and mm. Belfast and Glasgow. It's kind of you know they're almost like partners <laughs> in many good and bad ways. You know, aye, I, I, no, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. Um, so my next question, you did, right? This question was given by Martin Doherty, who mm-hmm. used to come on the Tempest stand. So, do you own a half and half hat with Celtic and Cliftonville? <laughs> I don't own a, a half and half hat, but I do have a half and half scarf um, because they played for Cliftonville's hundred and thirtieth anniversary in two thousand and nine. And that was a game where Celtic, <laughs> Celtic under Mowbray, get utterly humiliated, you know, by the part timers, and guys like you know Robson and Crossash and she were playing and Zaluska, and you know I've I've spoke to Cliftonville players since, and they've been like, they, they couldn't understand how Mark Crossash played for Barcelona. <laughs> it was dreadful, but uh, no, nah, it was it was enjoyable in one sense. It was their 130th anniversary, so for them to win it, you know, that was that was fine. But as a Celtic fan, it was kind of like. Another inclination of how horrendous Mowbray, would, Mowbray was going to turn out to be, you know, sadly. <laughs> Did Josh Thompson play that game? <laughs> I think he might have been. You know? <laughs> oh, he's instantly forgettable. You try and just put the guys out of your mind. <laughs> well, that leads me on to the next one. So, you spoke about the, the kind of link between Scottish and Irish to an extent. I mean, yeah. you, even, on, even on their side, you, you could see that as well. Yeah. Um, but, so, is there a big sell at Cliftonville support in Scotland? Is there anything out there? I would say there's a lot of Cliftonville fans who would have a, an inkling for Celtic, or, and then there'd be a smaller group who actively support them, and then there'd probably be another smaller group who really don't care. You know, it's kind of... I wouldn't say it's as... Um, I wouldn't say it's a, a massively strong link, you know, but mm-hmm. I think over the past few years, it's it's been built up because we've played them, obviously... In that 130th anniversary game, we sent over kind of like a, a younger team to play last year, which I think Tony Watt was playing in, and then obviously you know drawing them in this. Um, so it's the, the relationship since that kind of infamous game in 1984, I think it was, mm-hmm. they've kind of got back, and I think that's partly because Gerard Lawler, I think uh, Cliftonville's chairman, is a big Celtic fan, and they have got a good few Celtic fans in their team. So there's definitely there's definitely connections there, you know, um, even to the. Ridiculous extent where Frank McAvenny turned it as a trial thing for Cliftonville or, or played for them for like seven or eight games or something like that. And then, you know, further back you had, you know, Charlie Tully, I think, played for a while. Well, only a short spell as well, but um, there's been kind of a link up that way with the players. And right now they've got, I don't know if you remember Demi Ducaro, no? Yeah, yeah, but did we not try to send him to some Belgium team or something? God knows, probably. <laughs> ah, yeah, he's ended up in Belfast and he's done quite he's done quite well since he's uh, since he's joined. There's been a history of um ex Celtic players going to um Cliftonville and I mean as I, as I remember did Jerry Crossley no play there? Jerry Crossley did, uh Jerry Little, Jerry who's Little. A manager who you know you know he's mad cousin. <laughs> yeah. And um also, De- Decky Bunton, who right on board. Yep. he had to retire obviously through injury. He was there, um, played a few games, sort of thing, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so, right, there's a there's a there's a bit of a link there anyway as well with the players and 
and some of the some of the board members um, would be Celtic fans as well. Good, so eh? I think they're trying to cultivate the relationship, which you know makes sense. You which know, is me a bad thing, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the Belfast boys that we know have they've certainly bemoaned the fact, well, not so much lately, bemoaned the fact that we didn't go to Belfast, we would always go to Dublin, and even when we did go to Belfast, we would send half a team or Waynes or Tony Mowbray. Um, so so I don't see it being a particularly bad thing. I, I dare say Marty might disagree with the Perez. No, right. I, think he, I think he would have cut, like, a, it was two or three years ago, they had a friendly link uh, lined up with Glenn Torrin, but there was kind of, there was complaints about it out with, you know, the club, because I think Glenn Torrin were quite keen to have Celtic over, because obviously there's a wee bit of link there with Bertie Peacock and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and the folk that were complaining about it were kind of outside the club, so kind of Glenn Torrin were kind of upset, because, you know, Celtic, will come, Celtic fans will come to Belfast, regardless of whether they have to go into the wild, wild east. Of course, oh. aye. So. Aye. We, we don't need games to be moved to Tranmere and stuff when we're playing. To no. <laughs> right, you've kind of touched on it there, and I'm going to pick up on something you mentioned there, but just just for, just for in general, right, tell us a wee bit about Cliftonville. Not, nothing mental, just t- tell us where they're from, the ground... A wee bit of their history. How 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 did they become what they are? Um, the kind of the geographic shift. I mean, they're the oldest club in Ireland, um, founded in eighteen seventy nine. Um, they won a couple of leagues early doors in kind of the early nineteen hundreds and won a good few Irish cups. Um, but for a long, long while, they never they never won the Irish Cup. I think until nineteen seventy nine, having won it in nineteen oh nine. Hadn't won the league until 1998, um, from kind of the early 1900s. I think that was basically because they were pretty much an amateur team. So um, I don't think they've ever been relegated though, which is quite, which is quite a feat. Um, they came close, um, and actually, weirdly enough, they've won the league cup twice, and both times I've been there, sort of thing. So um, that just shows you. I mean, they've no, they've not been. Just glo- you're, a, you're a glory hunter. <laughs> Hi. I was at the two cup finals, and you know the game they won, the, the game they uh, presented with the league trophy. So I maybe a wee bit this year. Uh, no, I mean the, they've basically since kind of two thousand three, two thousand four, they've got their act together, kind of on and off the pitch, and they play. I think most people would agree that they play the, the kind of best football in that league. You know, it's only a kind of it's a, it's a small country, so it's it's not going to be a brilliant standard of football, but they definitely, without question. You know, play the best. They've got a lot of people involved. Um, you know, the supporters will go at night and clean the stand up and stuff like that. I mean, they're really, really. It's a really hard working club, and they deserve to be. You know, where they are at the minute. Um, and if they hold on to some of the players, some of the better players, they'll probably win the league again next year. You know, they'll, exactly. they'll become up. They'll become a force that. Um, you know, Glen Turner once we were kind of Glen Turner fell away because of financial difficulties. You know, Linfield have always had money because you know the IFA pretty much. <laughs> funds them, you know, mm-hmm. but um, they're very well. They're much better run. They're in a much better place. They've been in the top six since uh, for a good few years now. You know, they're not looking as if they'd ever drop back into the old ways. So, and they've also they've also um, kind of brought through players who have caught their attention of bigger clubs. I mean, obviously there's Liam Boyce there right now, who was at Werder Bremen. He'd been on trial at Celtic, and he's attracting interest again. And they sold. Um, a couple of years ago, they sold Rory Donnelly to uh, Swansea mm-hmm. and the Liverpool and stuff were interested in. So they've got a really good um, youth team as well, sort of thing. So they're kind of well run in a lot of levels at the club, you know. That's good, aye. And even like, they've, they've had a couple of good. This doesn't bode well for us, um, given, you know, we've been pretty poor in pre season, but they've had a couple of decent results in Europe where they've played teams like from Latvia or. or um, Croatia and they've, they've beat them. You know they've kind of upset them. Um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they don't get upset on Wednesday. But you know they're, they're capable of playing above themselves as well. Mm-hmm. Ah well, so so you, you touched on it there. So over the past couple of years, how how's the club been doing then? You said they won a couple of leagues and stuff like that. Yeah, they they won the league in the league cup this year, and they were unlucky not even the treble. They, they, could be, they kind of just run out of steam in the Irish Cup final. But they've been qualifying kind of regularly for Europe, which I think has helped um, financially. I mean, even getting one or two games, and obviously this game will be a. Uh, I mean, I, from a personal perspective, I don't see them pro- progressing. 
but they're going to make a fair um, a fair bit of money out of it, sort of thing. So that's always good, and they'll get a bit of attention. They've been featured on um, Sky Sports and the, the games that they pick up, um, and they seem to be kind of well liked by the Sky team. So and, and they always perform well in front of the cameras. So um, they've definitely they've been a team on the up since first of all. Eddie Patterson, who's now the Glen Torah manager, he kind of got them to a certain level. And Tommy Breslin, who's the manager um, right now, who used to be his assistant, has kind of took them up to another level, you know. So um, everything's kind of everything's kind of rosy in their garden at the minute, I'd say, you know. That's great to hear. Um, right, you touched on it just there, and I, and I never kind of primed you a bit. So tell us about the 1984 game. What's, what's the script with that? I've heard references to it. Just, just let everybody know what kind of happened that day. Well, um, I can I talk right now, but the, the way that Cliftonville actually police their games right now is they have their own sort of stewards. Mm-hmm. Because obviously, um, the, the club are kind of more or less, but not exclusively supported by nationalists. And that was the case, you know, back in 84 as well. And a Cliftonville Celtic game, by and large, leaving aside the odd nutter here or there, you don't really need to heavily police it. And they never needed to heavily police it back then. But basically, you know, the RUC, for whatever reason, decided that they were, you know, going to police it, going to be a bit of a show of strength, and ended up just causing utter chaos at the game, to the extent that obviously it turned into a riot, but as was the way, you know, at the height of the conflict, <laughs> the way the RUC were kind of viewed and stuff like that, they're really, a lot of people just feel that there wasn't any need for them to be there. And they were there to kind of antagonise, and that's what happened. And then that's how you see the pictures of kind of confused Celtic players back then looking up into the stands because they didn't really know what happened. And even Murdo McLeod was talking in one of his columns the day, and I, I still don't think he actually knows what happened. But it was, it was basically the RUC were antagonising mm. the situation, and that's that's what happened. It ended up getting abandoned, which is which is a shame back then, you know. And I think even um, some of Celtic's directors spoke about it and said that the police were shameful. So you know the blame kind of lies. Firmly with them, you know. And you know when the old board come and see stuff like that, they must have been put up against that. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> a doubt. Do, do you think? Do you think that had a bearing on the fact that Celtic never really travelled over to the the north as much? I think it probably did. To be honest, I think um, for whatever reason they probably thought it wasn't worth the the hassle if the police were going to believe that again. Mm-hmm. And like Cliftonville, kind of. They've kind of suffered to that extent because when they kind of at the height of the, the conflict, um, they had to play their home games against Linfield at Windsor Park, which, when you look back on that, is ludicrous. Uh, but that was the situation that they were they were kind of dealing with. So what know? was your logic? What was your logic with that? I think they just um, because you know Windsor Park's an international stadium. I think they thought it would be easier to get you know fans in and out of it, sort of mm-hmm. thing. But I'm sure they still had to run the <laughs> run the gauntlet at Windsor oh, Park. Yeah. You know, um, and I don't think obviously they didn't have a great success rate there. You know, playing technically away from home, but home sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So um, mercifully, that ch- that changed eventually. I, I, I do remember it. You've kind of provoked my my memory box here. I remember watching there was reports on the news and stuff like, that, and it was just a report about it was obviously during the troubles, and yeah. it was Cliftonville fans still going to see their team. And basically, every away game, they were running a gauntlet. Is that, am I, am I wrong when I was saying that? Well, I, 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 no, I think that's fair. Um, a couple of times I've been to Glen Torin, um and their ground's called the Oval sort of thing. And you kind of walk, like, now it's fine sort of thing. It's not it's not too bad, but you walk by kind of houses. And I've had a few mates saying, oh, we used to walk by here years ago. Like, this old woman would come out and they'd be lobbing bricks and they'd be lobbing this, that and the other. And to the extent you had to go into a kind of metal walkway and that, that kind of walkway is still there at, at Windsor Park as well um, and I'm sure when they had to go to um, places that were kind of smaller and even more hostile like a lot of the like Porter Down I think was always mentioned as a bad one and that a lot of the a lot of the, the kind of buses get their windows put in and stuff like that and there was a lot of hassle there I remember big Mickey Connolly actually talking about that as well um, so I think pretty much I mean there was Probably very few friendly teams. I mean, there was no Donegal Celtic back then. There was no, there was there was Newry Town probably. Oh my, they probably got a decent enough um, ride in. But the rest of the places I'd say would have been pretty, um, pretty hostile towards the fans. 
but mercifully that mercifully that has changed and even like a lot of the fans from the the smaller teams they will come into like Cliftonville Social Club and have a drink and there's no that same atmosphere anymore which is you know obviously a lot better for the best I think yeah Aye, OK, so we've done the brief, we've done the main thing here, so let's get into the, the gist of what Selic are walking into tomorrow, right? So this, you touched on a couple of players there, this going mm-hmm. about Cliftonville's danger, man, who are the main players, what's their strengths, and that's it. I'd say the main danger men are probably the two strikers, um, Liam Boyce, who like I said was previously at Werder Bremen, um, and Joe Gormley who they signed from um, Crumlin Star uh, just a local amateur team but he'd scored something like 60 goals in one season um, and since he's he's progressed year after year and I mean the two of them last year between them I think got something like 66 goals so they're very prolific boys is um, strong and powerful can hold the ball up good finisher Gormley's a wee bit, a wee bit more lithe a bit quicker um, so they're probably the danger men in terms of the other good players, Connor Devlin, the goalkeeper, who was a, I think he was formerly Man United, he's very good as well. Um, they're probably the three best players on the team. But in saying that, because a lot of the guys that are playing for the team um, grew up kind of supporting them, they really, really work hard. You know, they redouble their efforts and stuff like that. And they're a very, I mean, that would be unfair just to say they're hard working because that's a kind of cliche and, you know, it's a stereotype that you get with kind of small teams. But it's like I said, they play very good football on an AstroTurf pitch, so there's no, like, there's very few career in any tackles or it's, it's kind of a very fluid football for, you know, a kind of a smaller, a smaller league, you know. Um, so we're not going to, we're not going to back against, you know, cloggers or anything like that. They're going to try and play football and obviously, you would hope that uh, Celtic will be <laughs> better in that sense, but you know what it's like. I mean, just watching, and sometimes you can't kind of garner much for the preseason friendlies, but we've looked really, really disjointed and and pretty awful. I mean, the, the, the strength of the Clifton Villas, they look kind of unified, so we're going to have to kind of get our stuff together pretty quickly um, and just hope that we can, you know, go through. We should go through. I mean, we should go through. We have, we are. A, profession, a professional club with full-time players. That, I mean, Clifton Fowler a, a lot of part-time players and stuff like that, so we should. I mean, they're, uh, so there's, there's really no excuse, I'd say. No, but no. I, know we've, I know we've got injuries and stuff like that, but we should be able to cope. Mm. Um, but, you know, if that's football, you can you can always get an upset. I mean, we drew now now with some parts, so it's no beyond the of possibility we get a bad result there, you know? Who knows? Of course, aye. So, so that you're saying the strengths are the goalkeeper and the two men up top. Yeah. What's their weaknesses? Maybe that they, the the centre halves are, are maybe a bit on the small side, but even then they're still they're still fairly decent. Um, their weaknesses should I mean we should be fitter. I mean, we should have more stamina than them. You know the guys are going to put a shift in and then coming back. Your guys are playing football for a living. So, this, I mean, our stamina should be better. We should eventually, even if it was, um, if it was still kind of a draw, kind of late into the game, we should we should have enough to get a couple of a couple of goals maybe later on or that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. it's, like it was funny, and um, kind of going off topic a wee bit here, but a lot of the guys when they'd won the league basically went out in the uh, went out in the piss, um, and obviously because the league was won, there was two games after that. Um, and basically the odds were still good for Clifton Pro because there were league winners and stuff like that, but you just, like, from personal knowledge, you knew that a league was going to be playing. There's no chance they were going to play. Um, and so people were, like, lumping on. I was telling my dad and stuff to, you know, lump on the opposition, you know, stick 20 quid on. There's no chance they're going to win. They're going to play young boys. And, you know, lo and behold, that's what happened. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the difference. You wouldn't expect our guys to do that because nah. they're meant to be professional sort of thing. Um, maybe... Maybe the odd guy, maybe Paddy McCall and stuff, you know, they can just get the skill to get away with it. But, uh, no, nah, we should we should be, the stamina is probably the weakness, that's probably the thing that they might, they might fall down on. But they are they are a decent football team and they kind of know each other well and they link up well from kind of defence to midfield to front. So, it'll probably be a tougher game than a lot of people are expecting, I would say. 
Ah, nice one, nice one. That's that's pretty comprehensive with regard to team, right? So we'll we'll look to finish half the point here. So, in your opinion, knowing both clubs, how's it? How's the game, and where's it going to go, and how's the tie overall going to go? Well, like I said, I think we should progress, um, and we should probably win both games. I think the away leg will be tighter, and I think that's probably why Cliftonville wanted the game shifted, you know, just to give us, just to give us fans a bit of a, a show sort of thing. Um, so it might be, a, I'd maybe say a narrow one for Celtic at home, and maybe a, uh, a narrow one for Celtic, sorry, away, and maybe a bigger one at, at home. Um, but I don't know if it will be the, the trouncing that a lot of people are predicting, but I think I think Celtic can and should win both legs um, and should be comfortable enough to get through in the next round. Just out of interest, you said that Cliftonville were looking to, to move the match, is that correct? No, I don't think they were ever. No. They were ever looking to lose. I think they wanted to, you know, give some back to their fans and, you know, support them through thick and thin and they wanted to play at Solitude, you know, like I said, for years of him getting shunted around and when they first started playing in Europe and they hadn't, uh, of, of late sort of thing, when they hadn't had their Euro- European licence, they had to play at Glenarvan and stuff, so I think they were really keen to play it here. And, to keep it, yeah. Um, they wouldn't have, I don't I, I doubt it, even, even if they tried to move it to, to Casement, they might not have allowed for it, and Casement's getting done up and stuff like that. And there's really nobody, I mean, if you moved it to, uh, to Windsor Park, then you would have really struggled because one set of fans would have had to come in through I'll, I'll, uh, in inverted commas, the bad bit. Um, so <laughs> I don't think the coppers would allow for that. And UEFA, I don't think, let you go through the same entrance, even though Celtic and Clifford fans were doing fine. Um, so there's a whole lot of things. But I think, by and large, they just wanted to play it at their home ground to get something to shout about and make sure there was a, a sellout in their own patch. You know, the, kind of, the financial benefits came right back to them and didn't go to Windsor Park or the GA or anything else. You know, so... Um, fair play to them for doing that I think and that's good Jerry yeah, that's, that, that's bang on it? to be honest I've learned quite a bit about Cliftonville just off the back of that and I hope all the listeners do as well um, they, they, they certainly seem like a, a community club definitely yeah, that's that's almost a perfect way to describe them you know they're, they're really um, there's a real community focus um, on and off the pitch um, and they're they're a, they're a good wee club to follow, and you can also get a, a pint in a social at half time, so I don't know what else you want. There you go, hi. I sell it one, but I don't know what's <laughs> point. <laughs> right, okay, so we'll finish it off here, Jerry, and um, and I really, really appreciate you coming on. But before you go, would you like to tell everybody if you've got a Twitter handle? Have you, have you, you're doing, I, know, I know you've also got um, a, a wee project in the pipeline. I don't know if you want to kind of let the listeners know about that. Yeah, I will do it. Um, my Twitter handle is just, just my name, so it's uh, G-E-R-A-R-D-G-O-U-G-H. Um, right now, myself and a couple of journalistic colleagues were working on a newspaper for the Irish community in Scotland, um, tentatively called The Irish Voice, um, which we're hoping to launch pretty soon. So we're hoping to cover, you know, just the kind of sectors of Scottish society that kind of get kind of get left out in terms of, you know, Irish music and uh, the GAA, um, the Irish language, just any any kind of feel good stories from the the Irish community that, that tend to be missed, and also we'll be covering um, you know Celtic and Hibs and Dundee United. So we're hoping for if anybody's out there, they're looking for any stories from their, their CSC or their, their supporters club, be it Hibs and Dundee United, then if you get any good stories to send us in, then by all means file them up, file them in, and hopefully we'll be given proper representation in the media. And there's a Twitter for that as well. Yeah, that's what I feel like. It's just uh, I like just voice UK. So hopefully we're tweeting on that soon enough. That's excellent, mate. That's all, all comprehensive. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, can I thank you once again for coming on and, and giving oh. us your time? And I hope your team wins on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, Scott, and thanks for having us on. Nice one, good. Jerry. Speak to you soon, pal. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Well, that's us for a wee midweek special. Once again, I would like to thank Jerry Goff for coming on and hopefully found this edition interesting 
and maybe learn something you didn't know about the North Belfast side. Just to reiterate, Jerry's handle on Twitter is at Jared Goff, and the Irish Voice Twitter, which you touched on at the end, is at Irish Voice UK or one month. And if you so desire, you can hit the podcast up on at Temporary Stand. You can email us at Temporary Stand at hailhailmedia.com or get us on the usual message boards. So that's another one done. Um, hopefully, I'll be back with you on Thursday when I should really have the wakes. And then on Sunday, the rest of the lads should be back in business. So with the big match in mind, I'll leave you with a couple of Mayor Cliftonville fan songs. This time, aimed at the Glen Tone fans. So, um, good night, God bless, and hail, hail.